Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were singing all around the throne and around, and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to introduce Lorelai Ma to you this morning, who comes uh, with a very special invitation for us. But let me first begin by saying that as we approach the end of our fall series on togetherness, it's appropriate that this Sunday we consider just what it means to be together with every nation, tribe, people, and language. Because, you know, God never intended that you and I would be independent satellites in our own individual faith journeys with the Lord. His plans are so much bigger than that. And as Matt just was reading to us from that scene in Revelation, we find that God has a worldwide passion and a worldwide purpose of gathering joyful worshipers to himself from every tongue and tribe and nation and people group on this planet. Missions is not the ultimate goal and purpose of the church. I think that's one of the most surprising things that I learned in this last decade, is that the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose of the church is worship. And that's the scene that Matt was just reading to us from Revelation chapter 7, where there is this great multitude of people from every corner of the globe united together as they worship. And so we read a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb worshipped him. So missions is, in a nutshell, our way of saying that the joy of knowing Jesus Christ is not a private or a tribal or a national or even an ethnic privilege. No, it's for all. And that's why we send out missionaries. That's why a quarter of our budget here at Cornerstone is devoted to missionary work. That's why we pray and send people out. Is because that joy that we have of coming together and worshiping openly is just a foretaste of what God wants to do when Jesus returns and we have that scene all together. It's because we've tasted the joy of what that means to worship Jesus. And we want all the families on earth to be included in that joy. You know, we hear a song like our choir just did, and I don't know about you, but uh, I can't compete with that singing in the car as I'm driving with my own feeble voice. But to come here on a Sunday morning and to hear our choir and our musicians and all of you here gathered as we sing together, it's just something I can't begin to duplicate on an individual basis. And that's only a smidgen of what it's going to be like when we're all gathered together. Can you imagine? I don't know how we're going to have a joint worship service with all the believers of all time from every corner of the globe. But as the Bible says, what is impossible with us is possible with God. And he's got it figured out. He's probably got the plans already made for that. But the Bible says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. But here's my question to you this morning. 
How can people worship if they don't know Jesus Christ? And how can they come to know Jesus Christ if they cannot hear the gospel in their own language? And how can churches be planted if there is no gospel message to be preached in the people's language? John Piper says that missions exist because worship does not. And what he means by that is that there are so many places throughout the world where the name of Jesus Christ has still not been heard, where people are waiting for the Bible in their own language. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people groups who still have no portion of the Bible translated into their mother tongue. And Jesus said to us that he will return when, do you remember? Once this gospel of the kingdom has been proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. So we can speed the coming of his return. So my invitation to you this morning as we bring Lorelei Ma is to join God and his global purpose. Lorelai and Sammy Ma have been at Cornerstone since 1993. Lorelai has served as an elder. Sammy has been involved discipling the youth and the student population of our congregation for many years. They've raised their three children who are now adults here at Cornerstone. They make their home now in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, you may remember that they left uh, Cornerstone to head up World Relief in Baltimore. And since then, uh, God has taken them in further directions. It's because of Lorelei, actually, uh, that we are involved as a church with love in the name of Christ today, particularly in Kenya, because it was her invitation for me to come on a vision trip that opened the doors um, for loving uh, to get started. And she's back today with another invitation. And when Lorelei invites, I listen. <laughs> I do. Um, I'm, I didn't mention it in the last service, but as I stepped down from uh, chairing Love in the Name of Christ uh, for the United States, uh, Lorelei stepped in to replace me, and we couldn't have a better person at the helm. So uh, it's just a great privilege uh, to ask you to join me uh, in welcoming Lorelei Ma, who now is working with Wycliffe Translators uh, and uh, is here to share a little bit more about that this morning. Welcome, Lorelei. Oh, first, may I always forget. First, a, a short clip from the beginning days of Wycliffe. And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, and people and tongues stood before the throne. For them to be there, it's necessary for them to hear the message of God's love in their own language, a language they can understand. And that means someone must translate the message into every language on the face of the earth. And this is the task that is going to be done. And I believe that God is going to use thousands of Christians to do something about finishing the task. We pledge our lives to carry on. And we believe that every tribe on the face of the earth is going to hear that Christ died for their sin.
Good morning. It is great to be back at Cornerstone as we consider still this our home church, that uh, you all have sent Sammy and I out into the, into the world to serve God. Well, it was 3 o'clock in the morning when I got a phone call that no parent ever would want to get. Sammy and I usually turn our phones off at night, but for some reason, this night in October, Sammy decided he would leave his phone on, and at about 3 a.m., we got a persistent phone call. He went to shut off the phone and apologize for waking me up and realized that it was our youngest daughter, Victoria. Her phone number was on the screen. So he picked it up, thinking, uh-oh, 3 o'clock, phone call from a daughter, that's not necessarily a great thing. And sure enough, when we picked up the phone, Victoria was hysterical on the other end and finally was able to get out that she got a call from the hospital asking, do you know of an Andrew Ma? And she said, yes, that's my brother. Well, you need to come down. He's had an accident and it's bad. We don't know if he's going to make it. We've got the transplant team on standby. But if you can get here, get here. So she was describing that over the telephone and we kind of prayed real quick with her on the phone and told her to have her husband drive her because she was out of her mind. And Sammy and I immediately then fell to our knees at the side of our bed and began crying out to God, God, save Andrew. Be with the doctors. We know you see everything that's going on, so would you be with him? It's hard having an experience like that so far away. But I tell you, as we started praying almost immediately, we had a sense of peace wash over us. We knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were going to be okay. We didn't know how Andrew was going to be. We didn't know if he was going to be um, okay or not. But we knew God was in control and we could be okay. We told Victoria we'd be on the next flight, and sure enough, the next morning, we were uh, with, actually within a couple hours, we were on a flight to Atlanta got to the hospital, and the whole time we were just praising God. It seems so crazy at the time looking back, or even at the time if I would have explained to somebody who didn't know God that we had a sense of anticipation and joy of what God was going to do. And um, the peace that passes understanding, where does that come from? For me, it comes from building the foundation of my faith on the truth of Scripture, right? The truth that God is trustworthy, the God Almighty, the all-loving God of the universe. He orchestrates all my circumstances. He's good. He's for me. He's not against me. And so because of that, we had a peace knowing that when we got to the hospital, we didn't know if we'd be making medical decisions or funeral arrangements. And everything you and I face, the difficulties of life, we have the privilege of knowing that God cares about us. We know this because the scriptures tell it to us. We've experienced it. I can tell you that Andrew today, after his accident, it's a miracle. He's fine with no lasting damage. Even though every bone was broken in his face, you couldn't tell it if he walked through the door. He looks great. No brain injury. It's a testimony to what God did. And yet not every story turns out that good, I know. I know. It's praise God. Mm -hmm. But have you ever wondered about people that don't have God, that don't walk with Jesus, how they survive some of these hardships that come our way? Because life is hard, right? Without scripture in a language and form that's understood, people around the world are struggling to understand that they have a God who cares. Do you know that there are 1.5 billion, that's with a B, 1.5 billion people that do not have access to the full Bible? That's a lot of people. I'm often asked, well, why can't people just learn the national language? For instance, in Peru, Spanish is the national language. Can't people just learn how to read Spanish? Don't they teach Spanish in school? In Peru, there are 45 distinct languages 
Undis one can't understand the other, 45. And while there are some that do learn Spanish in school, it's not their mother tongue or their heart language. So we talk a lot about a heart language is a language that you learn at the knee of your mother when you're just a little one. It's the, the language that's typically spoken in the home. It's the language you dream in, that you think in, that you pray in. For me, that's English. But if I were in, in Peru, I learned a little bit of Spanish in middle school. I could probably get by. But if I were reading the Bible, sorry about that. If I were reading the Bible, I would probably be able to understand about 80%. And maybe those of you that know a second language that you learned in high school or college, maybe, you might get by. But I want to show you just a little exercise with John 3.16. John 3.16 is the very first verse that I memorized as a 10-year-old when I accepted Jesus. So why don't you read this with me? We all know it, I think. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Depending on the version that you're reading from, it's a little different. So for this exercise, let's assume that you've studied in school and you know a second language, and we know about 80% of the language. We're pretty good. So we have a lot of head knowledge. But if you were doing that, the, the way this verse might sound to you would be, this is 80% of knowing the language. For God so the world that he gave his one and only Son that in him will not have life. Changes the meaning, doesn't it? That's with only five words removed because we couldn't understand them. Well, what if we only knew 50% of the language? That's what the verse would look like. For God, the one and only Son, in him not but have life. This is why we do Bible translation. And I want to... Um, just from the perspective of a, a bishop in Africa, I want him to just share his heart a little bit to you about why Bible translation into a mother tongue is so important. When somebody stands and declares the word of God in the language of the people, you are not just using words, you are speaking to the hearts and minds of the people. And their response will, will come from the heart. But if you are uh, uh, talking to them in a language that they have learned, it will come to the head. <laughs> they will be trying to diagnose and uh, understand and uh, categorize what you are saying according to the rules of the language they learn. But if it is from their heart, they will blow up, they will open up, they will cry, they will laugh, they will rejoice, they will sing. It means that God is part of their tribe. It's one of them. It means that Jesus is one of them. He's their brother. He's their, he's their Lord. He's, he can understand their language. He can speak it. He can express they are what God wants them to hear in their language and they can understand him. It means that he understands their problems. It means that he, he, he can deal with whatever when they talk to him he's not a stranger. God wants us to, to hear him directly, to respond to him directly. After all, he created those languages and he hears them all, he speaks them all. Tongues of men and tongues of angels, they all be belong to him. And I know that this is the time for every ethnoi, every uh, uh, ethnic group, person, persons uh, in, in, their, in, their, in their mother tongue, for them to understand, for them to see what God is doing, for them to be able to own what the Lord is doing, and then be able to pass on that message within their own people and beyond their own boundaries onto the frontiers of the mission. I, I love that reminder that Jesus 
moved into the neighborhood. Jesus is the friend. He speaks the language. He understands. And isn't that, in fact, what Jesus did for all of us, right? The Word became flesh. The Word dwelt among us. That's Jesus, right? He became. So Wycliffe uh, Bible Translators, we have Vision 2025. Vision 2025 is in um, seven short years, six, coming on six. And it's our goal to see a Bible translation program in progress in every language still needing one by the year 2025. And actually, um, there are 7,000 117 living languages in the world today. A lot of times I try and make people guess, how many languages? Oh, 400. Nope. 1,000. Nope. Over 7,000 distinct languages in the world. And of those 7,000 languages, there are only 683 of them that have the full Bible. That's not very many. So that's where we get the figure of 1.5 billion people are still waiting to have the full counsel of Scripture in the language that they can understand. There are a lot of people groups that have never even had one Scripture translated. They don't even have John 3.16 in their language. That's 1,879 spoken languages and 283 signed languages, the deaf community. There are 284 distinct deaf languages, and not a single one of them has the Bible in them. Not even American Sign Language. American Sign Language, we're due to have that completed by 2020, and have that then as the base scripture to be able to work on the other 284 sign languages. So if you add that up together, there are 2,163 people groups representing quite a few million people that have not even heard one piece of scripture. Right now we have 200 and, or 2,600 projects that were in process in 170 countries. That takes a lot of manpower. And the good news is we're operating a little differently than we used to. It used to be we would have one family be raised up by a church like Cornerstone, be sent out to the field to do Bible translation work. Maybe they'd be sent to Africa. And when they arrived with their whole family, they would take a few years to learn the, the national language, the local language. They'd take another couple of years to learn the culture to make sure that they didn't offend or that they could fit in as much as a, a white person could fit in in an African culture. And <clears throat> then they would start the translation process, book by book, usually starting in the New Testament, finishing the New Testament, and then starting the Old Testament. Didn't have typewriters back then. A lot of times it was done on three by five index cards, put in a file to keep track. You just hope that you don't run into floods, fires, or theft. And oftentimes it would take 30 to 40 years to complete the New Testament and then there would be a big celebration. And then the scriptures would be printed and get into the hands of the people. And we figured that if we continue at that pace, the way that is, it would be over 100 years till we finish the work of Bible translation. And so about 10 years ago, when Vision 2025 came about, we invited um, many of the Bible translation organizations to come together to talk about what would it be like to accelerate the process. God's on the move. God's doing something. How can we impact that? And so now with technology, with computer programs, with um, clustering similar languages together, we're now sending people out to the field to teach local translators or local nationals how to do translation work. They already know the language. They already know the culture. And teaching them the specifics of Bible translation and coming alongside, we're now taking a process that used to be 30 to 40 years down to seven years. And not only that, with the ability to print on demand, as soon as one book of the Bible is finished, it's printed and got into the hands of the people. And that's usually within three to six months of starting a project in a country or in a language group that's never received it before. It's, it's amazing what God's doing. He's on the move in a big way, and it's really quite exciting.
I want to just share a quick video. I didn't share this in the last service, but this one is pretty um, amazing. If we can run that. Millions of people around the world live day to day without God's Word in their own language, representing over 2,000 living languages still waiting for Scripture. When they are fortunate enough to hear the Word of God, it's probably on a Sunday, and it's likely to be in a language that isn't their own. This makes comprehension difficult and keeps an understanding of His Word at arm's length. When it came to verses like, and whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, coming through to the Lugwere speaking person simply means, and whoever accepts to be baptized shall be saved. People, all, all what they wanted was to find a way to get baptized, and they thought, that's all that is needed for being saved. Paul was multilingual, so God could have spoken to him in Aramaic, could have spoken to him in Greek. But he spoke to Paul in the language of his boy. He spoke to Paul in the accent of his village because that was the best way of making the nexus of, of that human divine encounter. There are around 7,000 languages spoken in the world today. These are not dead languages, but living, breathing languages, spoken in homes in places like Nigeria, Peru, and the U.S. But if the language you think and experience emotion in doesn't have a writing system, then the Bible that you read will ultimately be in someone else's language. Best thing ever is to be able to read it, and then all of a sudden it touches you hard to the very core. You know, when I opened the Gospel of Mark, it was one of the most incredible things in my life because I could understand and I could visualize for the very first time the Word of God that was translated in my heart language. As if I was right there in the presence of Jesus Christ as He was teaching His disciples, you know. I preach more powerfully, vividly in my mother tongue than in any other language. We live in a dynamic and challenging world, and as Christians, we are called to act boldly in bringing the gospel to the nations. This can bring change to a community and holistically revolutionize their interactions with each other, with the outside world, and with God. So when I was talking to Brian about Cornerstone partnering with Wycliffe, we thought there's a community of people, the Napo Quechua. You'll see it's spelled Q-U-E-C-H-U-A or K-E-C-H-W-A. And actually, I think the people group prefers Quechua with a K. But it's in the circle up there at the very top of Peru along the Napo River. And it's near the Amazon, right between, uh, right south of Colombia and um, to the west of Brazil. And there are 10,000 speakers of Napo Quechua. And those speakers uh, struggle with literacy, they struggle with alcoholism, and they struggle with um, violence within the family. And so, the local translators are beginning a project with the Napo Quechua this year for the Book of Acts so that the people can understand what does it mean to be a church? What did Jesus mean about his church? And also the stories of David. So taking different stories and translating them from the life of David so that they can learn how to be a friend of Jesus, how they can be a friend of God, and how they can um, seek after him. And so that's the work that we're asking Cornerstone to continue or to participate with and um, the ways that you can do that are trifold. You can pray. A lot of times prayer is very critical in a translation movement. Many times a, a, trans, a Bible translation can't even get started until there's been lots of prayer. 
We have in your bulletin a finish line. It looks like this. You found it in your bulletin. This is actually a 30-day prayer guide that's really helpful if you want to stick it by your Bible and participate with us. And it's a different people group for every of the 30 days. And the reason it's important is these particular 30 that are listed in this booklet are really close to the finish of getting the New Testament or the whole Bible to the printing stage. And so what often happens is when a translation gets right to the end, Satan has a field day, and he'll throw up all kinds of roadblocks. Sometimes it's sickness in the translators. Sometimes it's a war will break out, other things, crazy stuff. And so the power of prayer is one of the only ways that we can get those translations completed. You could also pray specifically for the Napo Quechua, and also in your bulletin is a a guide that just talks about the people group a little bit and the, the um, challenges and the plan that we're looking at. So that would be really helpful. We can all join together in prayer. You can give. We have opportunities to support the Bible translation movement as well as specifically the Napo Quechua. And we have a, a, Brian will tell you a little bit more about it, but it's adopt a verse for the book of Acts. That's the book the book of the Bible that the translation team is focused on for the next 12 months. And so the adopt a verse is an opportunity for each one of us to adopt a verse for $35 for one time to get it done, to go towards that work. And you can also go. So I know Cornerstone already has a couple of families that are in the translation field actually Wycliffe translators that, you, that we support, and uh, that would be an opportunity. If God's put on your heart that you have a desire to be a translator, I've heard that already once this morning, then there's opportunities for you to go. Or if you feel like you have two months that you would like to support a translation team, we have lots of opportunities. If you're a teacher and you want to go teach, um, maybe some of the um, U.S. or Western children whose parents are translators. We have a big need for teachers. So there's opportunities to go. Or maybe you want to be part of a team that we'll take from Cornerstone next year to go and encourage the translation team right in Napo Quechua. And that would be an opportunity for us all as well. That picture you see up there is uh, Peru. And that's up in the mountains of Huanaco in the Andy Mountains. I was just there this past summer and um, sharing with a, a celebration for a New Testament for the Quechua people, one of the other tribal languages. So for Cornerstone, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for us to be part of what God continues to do. We're watching right now the gospel make unprecedented roads into people groups around the world, and God is at work. And I want to be where God's working, and I'm, I know that that's Cornerstone's heart too. So the goal is to have a Bible in every translation still waiting to have one, and um, God, we know God's going to have the ultimate victory. He's going to draw those to himself that he's called, and we have the privilege of joining him at that. And as we um, do that, I want to just leave with you before Brian comes up just a, a picture of one of the celebrations that took place after our 1,000th New Testament translation. Hi, I'm Russ Hersman. I'm here in the town of Koboko, northern Uganda, where we've just had the dedication of the 1,000th New Testament that Wycliffe and SIL have been involved in. This is the Teleko language of South Sudan. They're a refugee community here in Uganda. They have now received the gospel of peace. They're looking forward to peace in their country so that they can go back and share it with the rest of their people. New Testament, the first 500 took our first 67 years. The second 500 has only taken 17 years. 
and shows what God is doing to get His Word to the peoples of the world. Mm-hmm. You know, as we are going through life, we're investing in all kinds of things, and I've been thinking so much this past year about what is it that we can invest in that will really count for eternity. Because Jesus said, I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And as I had the opportunity in the spring to hear about these projects through Wycliffe and the opportunity for people to actually sponsor a translation, I came back to Pastor Chris and I said, what do you think? And he said, I can't think of anything better than to have our congregation sponsor a specific translation. And so we're excited to do that. We'll be doing that for the next three years through our mission budget and through other opportunities that come along. But I want to specifically specifically share with you about adopt a verse this morning and that is that we have the opportunity to have you actually sponsor the translation of a specific verse from the book of acts and so there are posters in the celebration center on tables along the left side of the book of acts it's a lot of posters and next to each verse is a line and if you would like to sponsor the translation of a verse Wycliffe has figured out that it comes to $35 a verse so it's a one-time gift and uh, there's directions on how to do that. Uh, if you want to think it over, uh, maybe look through the book of Acts. Uh, we'll have an opportunity next week to finish that campaign up. But I want to challenge you to think about Christmas gifts, birthday gifts, just a thank you gift to the Lord. I mean, how many of you have more than one version of the Bible in your home? I've got all kinds of them that are there. What a great way to say thank you to the Lord uh, and to to say, I want to be part of that. I think when we get to heaven and we have the opportunity to meet people who can say thank you for your involvement that brought the Bible into my language so that I could hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't get any better than that for me. I still like to eat a lot of Oreo cookies and Milky Ways and other things like that. Those investments don't last too long for me, maybe a couple of hours. But this is one that can last for all eternity. So we challenge you to do that uh, following the service. Please take a walk over into the celebration, take a look at that. And uh, let's close with prayer and then we'll invite Dr. Rose up as we finish in song. Father, we thank you for your heart, your heart that wants a whole globe of people from every tongue and nation and tribe to worship you. And we thank you for the abundance of the Bible literature that we have here in the United States. Lord, increase our heart for those people groups who still do not have the Bible. May we pray for those opportunities, those translations that are finishing up this year. And we look forward to that day coming up, whether it's a year from now or shortly after that, where we can bring a group from Cornerstone over to Peru to celebrate in the finishing work of the translation of the book of Acts. Thank you for giving us a part of this work for your glory. We commit it to you and pray that many will come to saving faith through it. In Jesus' name, amen.